All right, so 14 said, use the intercept form to find the general form of the equation of the line with the given intercepts. So general is the same thing as standard form. Don't ask me why they call it two different things. It means the same thing, which is your AX plus BY equals C. No fractions, no decimals, X and Y on the same side, X positive. So that's what we want to end up with at the end. And then it says the intercept form of the equation of the line, like it gives you all this, which I actually think is more confusing than anything else. What you have here is an x-intercept and a y-intercept, which means you already have the b if you're going to plug it into slope-intercept form. And then the only other thing you need is your slope. You have two points there. So if I take my y2, which is 6, subtract from it my y1, which is 0, over my x2, which is 0, minus my x1, which is 5, I end up with 6 over negative 5 or negative 6 fifths. So that's the slope. And then you already have the B, like I said before. So this would be Y equals negative 6 fifths X plus 6. If it asks for it in slope-intercept form, you're done. But because it says general form or standard form, you're going to, well, first I would get rid of the fractions. So I'm going to multiply everything by 5. And I get 5Y equals negative 6X plus 30. And then I needed x and y on the same side, and I need x to be positive. So I'm going to move the 6 over here. I'd get a positive 6x plus 5y equals 30. Actually, general form puts the, the, the 30 on the side. Sorry. General form puts the 30 on the side with the x and the y. If you do get a question on your like test to put it in a different form than slope-intercept form, it would be standard form, which puts the 30 on the other side. Any other questions from the homework? Yeah. Wait, so is it equals 30 or? It's, it's like this, the minus 30 is on the side with it because it's general form. If it was standard form, it'd be like this one, which is how it would ask for it if it was on your test. It will either be standard or slope intercept. Okay. Yeah. Do you have it in front of you? And is it parallel or perpendicular? Okay, so I'm assuming A, parallel, B, perpendicular. So this line is a special line because it's missing a variable. If it's a Y equals, then it means it's a horizontal line. And it means my slope is zero. So the slope of a line parallel to it's going to be the same, which is zero. And then I'll use negative 5, 3. The slope of a line perpendic perpendicular to a horizontal line is a vertical line. And a vertical line has undefined slope, which means we won't be able to plug it in. Undefined <coughs> slope is an x equals equation, and you just grab the x. So that one, there's no way to plug it in. You've got to just know if it's horizontal, then it's perpendicular, it would be vertical, and vertical is an x equals. For the other one, if it's parallel, my slope is 0, so I can actually plug it into the line, or just know that it's a y equals and grab the y, which would be 3. If you plugged in 0, you'd get y minus 3 equals 0 times x plus 5, and you'd get y minus 3 equals 0, and you'd get y equals 3. So you'd get there eventually anyways, but it's obviously faster to just remember if it's horizontal, it's an y equals, and if it's perpendicular, it's an, I mean, if it's vertical, it's an x equals. Any other questions from the homework? The rest of the chapter, we start to get into different kinds of, of um, graphs. So we started with lines. Today, we can still do a little bit of lines within functions, but then we're going to get into like parabolas and square roots and all that stuff before the end of the chapter. So section one is really just the lines and stuff like that. And then we start talking about function notation, which is like, it's like a hot topic on standardized tests, okay? Functions, by definition, for each value of x, there's only one y value. So in order for something to be a function, the x cannot repeat with a different y. x cannot repeat with a different y. So x can repeat as long as the y also repeats. Like you could have a duplicate point. But if you have more than one x with different y's, no, if you have one x, sorry, with more than one y, so a point would be above or below it directly in line, then it can't be a function. 
instead of a y, you'll now see f of x. f of x is the same thing as y. So if I had y equals x plus 3, you'll now see it written as f of x equals x plus 3, and those mean exactly the same things. The difference is they just won't be only lines anymore. And in order for them to be a function again, an x can't repeat with a different y. So you can't have an x with a y being 1 and an x with a y being 5. You can't have them above or below each other. That would not be a function. And you'll see that function test in three ways. Like it will, it will either ask you, is it a function based on coordinate points? Is it a function based on an equation? Or is it a function based on a graph? So the first is the points, okay? So if you look at all your x's, if none of the x's repeat, you don't even have to worry about looking at the y's. So the first test is look at all the x's. Do they repeat? So if I go to 1, my x's are 1, negative 2, and 3. Do any of those repeat? No. So this is automatically a yes. I don't even have to look at the y's because a y can repeat. It's just the x that can't. Then I go to 2, and I look at all the x's. 1, 1, 1, and 2. Does an x repeat? Yes. Now I look at what it repeats with. If it's a completely duplicate point, if it was 1, 1, and another 1, 1, it'd be fine. Or 1, 2, and another 1, 2, it'd be fine. The problem is that the x remains the same, but the y changes. If that happens, this is a no. And again, thinking back to what that would look like, if I had 1, 1, my coordinate point would be here. If I had 1, 2, my coordinate point would be here. You cannot have them down a vertical line, so it can't be above or below. And then 1, 3 would also mess that up. So even if just two of those happened, it would be a no. Then you'll get ones that look like they have those charts. So the x values are on the left, the y values are on the right. If you look at 3, the x's don't repeat, so 3 is a yes. If you look at 4, this x goes with that y, so if you re needed to rewrite them in coordinate point form, you totally could. And then you have a negative 2 that goes with both a 1 and a negative 2 that goes with a 0. So that x repeats with a different y, which means this is a no. So the good news on web assignment, you still get three chances. Please don't get these wrong, okay? But on your test, that's a 50-50 shot, so be careful, okay? So the X cannot repeat with a different Y. The second way you'll do it is called a vertical line test, and this is how you will check from a graph. If you just remember vertical line test, this means if I have a graph of any kind of a function or any kind of graph, and I draw a vertical line through it. If it intersects my graph at more than one point anywhere on the graph, it fails the vertical line test and it's not a function. <clears throat> so if you think about what happens, like if you had, let's say you have a sideways parabola, okay? If I draw a vertical line through this, it's going to hit it at more than one point and that's a no. If I have a normal vertical parabola, I could draw vertical lines moving left and right all the way across this graph, and it's never going to hit it at more than one point, so that's a yes. And the last test comes from an equation. So that one was from the graph. This one's from an equation. And this is where you have to think of what makes a graph turn sideways that has points above and below, and those are really only two cases when the y is raised to an even power, like your equation is a y squared or a y to the fourth or a y to the sixth or a y to the eighth, anything like that, that's gonna be a parabola turned on its side. Or the y is in absolute value because that is a v turned on its side. All of those are going to fail your vertical line test, right? If I had a parabola turned on its side, it's going to fail the vertical line test. If I have a V turned on its side, it's going to fail the vertical line test. So all that information should overlap. If it's a V, it means it's going to be turned on its side. It would fail the vertical line test. It means that the same X would have two Ys, okay? So all three of those, it either passes them all or it fails them all. It's not like it can pass one and fail the other.
All right, so from an equation, and again, these should be easy. These should be fast. You just have to know. God bless you. When is it not a function? What am I looking for? God bless you. You just wrote it out. What makes it not a function if it's in an equation? Y raised to an even power or Y an absolute value. Now we just look. In number one, do you have Y raised to an even power or an absolute value? Nope. So this is a yes. This is a function. Two, do you have Y raised to an even power or an absolute value? Yes. So this is not a function. Three, function or not a function? Not a function. That Y is raised to the even power. Four, function, not a function. Yes, the X is raised to the even power, but the Y is fine. So these two both have that raised to an even power. Doesn't have to be just squared. It could be any even number. All right, now you get the actual plugging in of values. And this, again, is another thing standardized test love. So it will say something like F of 3. And all that means is it started as f of x, and we replaced the x with a 3, so you're going to do the same thing with your equation. So if f of x equals x plus 2, then I'm going to rewrite that as 3 plus 2, which is 5. So you're plugging the number, or it could be an expression inside the parentheses, into the variable that was there before in the equation. So usually it's an X, but you also see sometimes it'll say like F of T or F of B, and then it will say B equals, and then you're going to plug that in. Or it'll say F of a number, and you'll plug it in the place of that variable. So it's not always X. If it's a graph, it's always X, but it's not always X. And they can look like this. So evaluate the function of f of x, so f of x is constantly changing. This time f of x is x squared plus 3x plus 1, and g of x is negative x squared plus 4x plus 1. And number one says find f of 0. <coughs> so I know I'm going to go to the f of x function, because that's the letter on the front, the f, not the g. And everywhere there's an x, I'm going to plug in a 0. So I'd get 0 squared plus 3 times 0 plus 1. And I get 0 plus 1, which is 1. And sometimes it will just ask for that, and sometimes you'll see it written as f of 0 equals 1. And that means when my x is 0, my y is 1. Number two, we're going to take 1 into the f of x, again, function, because that's the number you want to use, and plug 1 in everywhere there's an x. So 1 squared plus 3 times 1 plus 1, 1 plus 3 plus 1, which is 5. So f of 1 equals 5. Questions so far? All right, 3 f of negative 1. So now everywhere there's an x, we plug in a negative 1, and we plug it in parentheses. So this would be negative 1 squared plus 3 times negative 1 plus 1. And that is important because negative 1 in parentheses squared is different from negative 1 squared. So I get 1 minus 3 plus 1, negative 2 plus 1, which is negative 1. So f of negative 1 is negative 1. And now I get g of 2. So instead of plugging into the f function, we're plugging into the g function. Watch your signs here. This is negative 2 squared plus 4 times 2 plus 1. And what comes first in PEMDAS? Ex exponent or multiplication? Exponent. So we're going to raise our 2 to the power of 2 first, and then multiply it times the negative 1 or take the negative. 
which means this is negative 4 plus 8 plus 1, 4 plus 1, which is 5. So don't let things like that get you. Watch your order of operations. You would square it and then take the negative. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. This should be G. Okay, 5 says G of T. So now we're taking that G of X function, and everywhere there's an X, we're plugging in a T. So I'm going to get negative T squared plus 4 times T plus 1. And then there's no simplifying there. It stays almost exactly like the original one, except that everywhere there was an X, there's now a T. All right, and then 6 says g of x plus 2. So everywhere there was an x, I have to actually put that expression in. The negative is going to go on the front, so it's negative x plus 2 squared plus 4 times x plus 2 plus 1. Now, order of op operations says I need to raise this exponent. Do I distribute that exponent? For the love of God, no, right? We expand and foil it. Hopefully, we're getting better at the shortcut because you can use it here. This would be negative. Square the first one. Square the second one. Double the product. If you're still not great at that, then you rewrite it next to each other. Expand and foil it. You get the same answer. First, outer, inner, last. Then I distribute the 4. So plus 4x plus 8 plus 1. Now the negative on the front is going to get distributed in. I get negative x squared minus 4x minus 4 plus 4x plus 8 plus 1. And then I combine all my like terms. So I get negative x squared, negative 4x and positive 4x cancel out. Negative 4, positive 8 is positive 4 plus 1 is positive 5. And g of x plus 2 equals that expression. Negative x squared plus 5. Yep. Sure. All right, so for h of 2, I'm taking the 2 and I'm plugging it into the x. So I get 10 minus 3 times 2 squared. 2 squared is 4. 10 minus 12 is negative 2. Better? <laughs> yeah. All right. Then h of negative 2. So this time we're plugging in a negative 2. 10 minus 3. Negative 2 goes inside the parentheses, so that negative is going to stay with the 2 when I square it, which means I get 4 again, I get t minus 12 again, and I get negative 2 again. And the last one, h of of x minus 1, that x minus 1 is going into the x. I'm going to expand and foil that first or use the shortcut, which is x squared minus 2x plus 1. Then be careful. People tend to like combine these together first. That 3 is attached to the parentheses. You can't separate it out. This gets distributed. So I'd get 10 minus 3x squared plus 6x minus 3. And then combine your like terms, so negative 3x squared plus 6x plus 7. Order right now, not important, like it doesn't say it has to go in decreasing degrees, so if you put the 7 first, that's okay. Web assign will still mark it right, just be really careful with your signs there. Good so far? Questions? <coughs> okay, so then we get into something called a piecewise function, okay? Piecewise functions mean certain parts of your values will be different expressions. So it will look like this, like it literally has like a, a brace here and it says x, f of x will be x squared minus 1 for all the values in which x is less than 0. And then x, f of x will equal x minus 1 for all the values in which, f, in which x is greater than or equal to 0. 
So what you have to do is using the X that they give you, so whatever's inside the parentheses, you're gonna go to the right side first and you're gonna say which of those two does that X fall in? And then whichever one it does fall in, you would use the expression to the left to plug it into. So when I start with negative one, so the first one is F of negative one, which of these two would be would work for negative one is negative one less than zero or is it greater than or equal to zero less than zero which means i'm going to plug that negative one into that expression so i'd get negative one squared minus one which is one minus one which is zero there is only one answer it's not like you plug them into both and you get both answers that's it one answer now go to b I get f of zero. Is zero less than zero or is it greater than or equal to zero? Greater than or equal to. So I'm gonna plug it into that expression, zero minus one, which is negative one. And the last one says f of one is one less than zero or greater than or equal to zero. Greater than or equal, so again, I use the bottom one and I get one minus one, which is zero. There can be more than just two parts there. It could be split any way you wanna split it, but it's the same process. Take the number that's inside the parentheses, figure out which range it's true for, and then use the expression that's next to that one to plug it in. All right, then it says, so we have to start to decipher like regular words into what does that actually mean, right? So this says, find where f of x is zero. So it's also where the x-intercepts are. If f of x equals zero, what other letter equals zero? What's f of x the same as? Yeah. Y. So we're saying where would y be zero, right? On a graph, y would be zero at the x-axis, which means these are also all x-intercepts. Instead of plugging zero in for x here, because it's not inside the parentheses, we are replacing the whole f of x with zero, which means every single one of these, all you do is take this and change it to zero. So I'd get zero equals negative two x plus one. And then I solve for x. So I would add the two x, two x equals 10 and divide by two. And x is five. So if I had actually graphed it, I think it will give you the x equals space and you'll just put the five in on web assign. If I had graphed this equation, it would be a line. My y-intercept would be at 10. My slope would be negative two over one. And when I cross the x-axis, it would be at positive five. So like all that information can now overlap. The graph with the actual, God bless you, x-intercept, or in this case where f of x is zero. These are also eventually gonna become zeros or roots of my solution. I'm going to have my equation. All right, I go to two. Again, replacing f of x with zero. This time I got to do what? Factor. So are there factors of positive six that sum to negative five? Good. Negative two, negative three. And then we split and solve. And I get x equals two and x equals three. So there are two answers there. If it wanted it in an intercept form, it would have been two zero and three zero, but that's, it won't ask for it that way, this section. Okay, go to three again, replacing the f of x with zero. And I actually have two choices. What can I do? What's one way to solve that? Different to two squares. The other way? Good, add the 16 and then square root both sides doing the plus and minus. So either way gets the same answer. I would get x plus four and x minus four, split and solve, and I get x equals negative four and x equals positive four. Go to four, replace your f of x with zero. 
Then what? Good. I get x times x squared minus 81. Is that factored completely? Nope, because I can do what? So I have to do squares again, x plus 9 and x minus 9. And this time I have three x's. x is 0, x is negative 9, and x is positive 9. I don't know if it says put them in order of least to greatest. Just pay attention to the directions. I don't remember. If it does, obviously that's the order. If not, it doesn't matter. And on an open-ended test, you could just write a plus or minus next to them. You can do zero, comma, plus or minus nine. That's fine. Obviously, web sign, you need to separate it out. Questions on that one? Okay. And the last one on this slide, plugging zero in for f of x. Then what? Multiply three on both sides. Zero equals five minus six x. This is gone. Add the six x. Divide by six. And x is five sixth. And again, remember you want to keep them exact. If it's a simple, if it's a fraction that can be simplified, you want to simplify it. But you want to keep it exact and you want to keep them improper if that was not improper. Like if it was a mixed number, you want to keep it improper. Yeah. Um, it's usually always zero in these cases. It could, and you would do the same thing, just replace f of x. Like, but that would be like, what, what's the x value when y is five? So you would plug the five in for the f of x and you'd find the, the x value. Um, but for these, usually it's zero because you're fine. You're, we're starting to slowly get to the point that we're going to use these on a graph, but it doesn't mean it's always that way. You, if it was any other number, you would just do the same thing. Just replace it with the value that they give you. Just be careful, right? So like the difference between if it says f of x equals 3 or if it says f of 3. In this one, we're replacing the whole f of x with 3. And in this one, we're replacing the x with 3. So that's the difference between those two. And standardized tests love to do stuff like f of 3 equals 1. And that is a coordinate point disguised in function notation. What's inside is the x, and what it's equal to is the y. So this is actually 3, 1. That's a coordinate point on a graph. And it loves to throw it in there to totally throw you off. It's really easy, but it throws you off if you don't know what that means. Now it's saying find where f of x equals g of x. So it's giving you two functions. One is f of x, one is g of x, and it wants you to know whether they're equal. So you literally just set them equal to each other. I would set this equal to this. So x squared plus 1 equals 3x minus x squared. Now what? Good. So I'd add the x squared. I mean, you could subtract it, but I would add it to keep it positive. And I get 2x squared plus 1 equals 3x. Hopefully, seeing an x squared there and an x tells you that you're going to have to do what? Factor. Factor. Get everything to one side. So I'm going to subtract the 3x. And then you can do first and last here, but this one's easy to do trial and error. If I do 2x and x, and then I just need the factors of positive 1, that when I do outside and inside, it's going to give me a negative 3. So negative 1 and negative 1. Outside, negative 2x. Inside, negative 1x. And that's my negative 3x. So that's the combination that works. If you want to do first and last, do it. You'd still end up with the same. And then we split and solve. And I get 2x equals 1. And x equals 1 half. And x equals 1. All right, so again, we're setting these equal to each other. I'd get x squared minus 1 equals negative x squared plus x plus 2. I'd want to add the x squared. I'd get 2x squared minus 1 equals x plus 2. Again, there's an x and an x squared, so I'm going to move everything. I'm going to subtract the x and the 2. 
and I get 2x squared minus x minus 3 equals 0. And then, again, you could do trial and error. You could do first times last year. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. Are there factors of negative 6 that sum to negative 3? What are they? Negative 3, positive 2. I get 2x squared minus 3x plus 2x minus 3. And then I'd factor by grouping. Take out an x. 2x minus 3. The other one already matches, so technically there's a 1 on the front. 2x minus 3, and I get 2x minus 3, and x plus 1. And then I would split and solve, and I get 3 equals 2x, so x equals 3 halves, and x equals negative 1. What were to happen if when I moved it all it wasn't factorable, what could you do? You could either do quadratic or, what's your other option that always works? Not always fun, but it always works. Complete the square, okay? So if when you moved it and you multiplied like that first and last, you found that there weren't any factors of that that sum to the middle term, those are your backup options. And those will always be your backup option, options. So they like go nowhere. Because as long as they produce a real number, we'll even be able to graph them. They might be ugly, but we'll even be able to graph them. Questions on anything we covered today or the homework from last night? All right, your 2-2-A two, two is on WebAssign and open on Canvas for the, your submission. Um, it's, it's, I feel like it's like 14 problems or something. So if you want to get a head start on it, it would probably be a good idea. You've got some time. You've got 10 minutes if you want to get a head start on it.